Welcome to Digital Sensory Storytime Part 4. In this segment, we're going to talk about communication during story time. I am your presenter, Amy Price, librarian at Oakstone Academy in Westerville, Ohio. In this segment, we're going to take a look at some different strategies for communicating with the children with autism that are in your story time. So we want to have a lot of different strategies available to us for communication because communication is a core deficit of the disability. So we want to be able to overcome that as much as possible. Um, it is difficult to tell if a child has expressive or receptive language delays just based on their verbal skills. Some individuals are very verbal but do not are not using that language to communicate. They're simply using the language for something that gives them feedback but not to communicate with other people. Um, you can have individuals with autism that are hyperlexic so they can read any word but they don't have a good concept of meaning behind words. So you want to use these regardless of the verbal abilities that are you're able to see in your children with autism. You want to go ahead and use these strategies to help that communication be more solid and concrete. So the visual schedule is one of the strategies that we use to communicate. This can help even typically developing preschoolers understand where you are at in the activity. So you see there's a simple example there of activities that need to be done, the sequence of those activities, and then they can be moved over to the done section once they are done. So you want to just have some icons that are, and you can use real pictures or you can use board maker icons, which we'll talk about next, and put them in row. A lot of times they're done on Velcro so that they can be easily used again. You can just tape them in the row and then you want to take the activity off once it's done and move it over into the done column so that they understand where they're at in the sequence of events, when things are going to end, when things are going to happen, and you get that security level. Individuals with autism or other language delays are often taught to communicate using board maker icons. Um, sometimes this is called PECs. Sometimes there are different picture communication terms that people use for it, but BoardMaker is a software program and it contains millions of icons that represent everyday events. And BoardMaker icons are the most commonly used icons in communication with this disability. So the preference would be to purchase a basic version of the software so that you have access to all the icons that you need and you have the ability to make them larger or smaller, all of those types of things. If that's not a possibility, you can find um, free BoardMaker icons by signing up for BoardMaker Share or BoardMaker Achieve. And both of those will give you some access to free icons that are your basic items that you would need. However, if you have any ability to purchase a license of the software, you will find it much easier to access the icons because once you start thinking about all of the different directions that you give verbally and trying to have an icon for each one, then you discover that you need a lot of icons to do that. So it's easier if you just have access to all of those icons. In addition to using board maker icons with your visual schedule where you can use the icons or you can use real pictures, they are also very useful for communicating with an individual child during story time. You can print them out on a piece of paper, laminate them, hole punch them, and put them on a ring so that you have them in your pocket or somewhere that's easily accessible. And then when you're giving a child an individual direction, like sit in your chair 
or we're going to do this activity, then you can simply show them the icon. This gives them a visual prompt in addition to your auditory prompt that you're giving them. And most of the board maker icons also have text on them, so you are reinforcing that text as well. But the biggest thing that you want to get from your board maker icons is the ability to communicate with a child that is not processing expressive or receptive language properly. If you have access to whiteboards and projectors in your story time area, this is also another great way to display board maker icons or to show your interactive ebook. Using the projector obviously makes it larger and louder. So if you have access to those types of technologies, that is a great way to communicate with the group and a great way to present your story. Our school uses the reflector software because we do have a PC network. We have interactive whiteboards, but they are all connected to PCs. So the way that we are able to display what's on the iPad up on a whiteboard is by use of the reflector software. And you can use the reflector software on Macs as well. So that's a very inexpensive piece of software that allows you to mirror what's on the iPad onto your desktop or laptop and then if that is connected to your whiteboard or if you have a projector that projects what's on that screen up onto a whiteboard then that can be a real asset in your story time to make it larger and louder. Now in our story time recommendations we have configured it so that the adult has control over the device at all times. We don't recommend having a whole group of individuals go into a room and you give them iPads. They will be very, very happy, um, but keeping them on task will be next to impossible and transitioning them away from technology can be very, very difficult. So while the iPad and all kinds of devices are very effective with this population, it is a situation where you want to be clear about what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if you you want to do a activity where each child has an iPad, then you can use guided access, which is an accessibility function in the iPad, and you can use that to lock down the iPad into the app that you want the child to do. If you don't do that, you will find that they are very, very, very speedy at a very young age and able to get to whatever it is that they like to play on the iPad or whatever website they like to go to on the iPad. So our recommendation is more that the device is a tool for the story time presenter, not as much a tool for the individual with autism. As I mentioned before, transitions can be very difficult for children with autism. So you want to make sure that you have everything that you can at your disposal to make those transitions go as smoothly as possible. One tool that you can use is a visual timer. This is just a simple timer, but instead of just clicking down the minutes, it actually shows the red part decreasing. So it's much more visual than just a basic egg timer, but it helps the child have a visual of how much time is left. Obviously, you would want to use all of the traditional auditory warnings and things that you do with typical preschoolers, but it's helpful to have an additional visual with this population. In addition to giving as many verbal and visual warnings that an activity is ending and a transition is coming that you can think of with this population, you also might want to consider being able to take whatever activity it is out of sight of the group. So if you have a group that's having trouble 
transitioning, say, away from the train table, then it can be helpful to, instead of using a train table, use rugs that have mats on them that can be rolled up and put away. That's a much more visual, concrete way for them to know that activity is over, we're done with that, it's put away, instead of maybe having the train table just sitting there and them not understanding it's time to transition or just wanting to not transition and being tempted by that thing that's just sitting there in front of them but they can't have it. So any activities that can be converted like that to a situation that's more concrete will help with your transitioning. Obviously with any story time activity that involves preschoolers, you want to have some group size limit, but when you're working with children with autism, you probably want that group size to be a little more limited because they do have trouble tolerating other people and large group situations. It's a lot of noise, it's a lot of movement, it's hard to process. So you want to limit your group size to what you are comfortable with and what is successful for the individuals in your group. Another thing that you can do is recruit college students who are in special education, occupational therapy, speech therapy. A lot of them are looking for experience working with individuals with autism or other disabilities and they are willing to come out and lend a hand and kind of try out some of the things that they're learning in the classroom in the real world. And that can be very helpful to have an extra set of hands if you have a child that's having a bad day or just to engage the children in social play activities. Obviously, that does not come naturally to children with autism. And so having an extra person there to prompt them and help them stay on task and be engaged in the activity can be very helpful. If you are able to get some volunteers, particularly those who have an interest in this disability and are young um, and have a lot of energy, that can be a great help to the caregivers and the parents as well. Um, obviously, you want them engaged in the story time. They need to be in the room and be involved. However, you do have to realize that this disability affects the whole family and be sensitive to parents who are very tired and worn out. Often individuals with autism do not sleep regularly and therefore their caregivers do not sleep regularly either and they have a lot of issues and so their parents and caregivers are the ones that are looking for programming and scheduling things and trying to help this child as much as possible and that can be a very draining process. Um, it's a great time to display books about autism. There are a lot of books that will help parents and caregivers know how to work with this very difficult situation and your library probably has many many of these books and allowing the parents to network with each other and also take a look at whatever the latest is in the book market or the information market can be very helpful to them and it can be good for the child as well to have someone else that they can work with. So that's very dependent on you being able to recruit volunteers, particularly capable volunteers that have an interest in very hands-on activities with this population. But if you are able to do that, it can very much help your story time be successful. Another thing that you want to be sensitive to with parents and caregivers is the fact that this is a very intense disability. So if they are unsuccessful one time at your library, if you have an activity that is geared towards children with autism and it doesn't go off well, they are very unlikely to continue to keep trying. They are placed in a situation where there's a lot of demands on their time and their energy and their child's time and their child's energy. Often they're trying to do a 40-hour week program with a preschooler. 
So, and they're trying to get all of the workers to do that and keep the programming up and all of those things. So they do have a very short attention span for anything that doesn't work. The more that they see something work, the more dedicated that they will be to having their child in that program. So the more of these things that you can put in place as you're doing your story time, the more that they will see that the library is a place that really knows how to and wants to work with their child. And then they will become very dedicated patrons. But you do want to be sensitive to the fact that they talk a lot and they are going to tell each other that's the good library that's the library where they know how to work with kids with autism and then you will get lots of people flocking to that library and they will tell each other if that's the library that really doesn't know what they're doing or they really haven't implemented the strategies that can be successful with autism, then you will get vo very poor attendance. So if you're in a situation where you've had a sensory story time and you have one or two families come and then they don't come back, it will be very helpful for you to try to implement some of these strategies so that it's a more successful experience for not only that child but that parent or caregiver as well so that you have something that engages kind of the whole family unit because this disability very much affects the entire family so you want to add as many in there as possible so that you have that success and then you will find that your story times will grow that it will very much be commun communicated through your local autism community that this is a place that understands and can work with this population of children so that's kind of a trend that you want to watch for as you're working with families of individuals that have autism that they're going to very much gravitate towards places that know how to work with their, their children and their family and if you can be one of those places the more things from this series that you can put in place the more you will be one of those places that those patrons that have children with autism and their children feel welcome and feel successful. We have a few websites here for some further resources on sensory story times to get more ideas about how to have successful sensory story times. And we want to thank you for listening to our series and hope that it has helped you in giving you some ideas to get those children with autism into the library and engaged in story time.